Welcome to the BMR webinar on the Union Budget 2016. This is the third budget of Finance Minister Jaitley, and it clearly has a stamp of Prime Minister Modi. Our conversation today will include a brief overview of the macroeconomic indicators, some of the regulatory changes around foreign investment. There are nearly 170 odd changes in the direct access code. Uh, we will try and cover some of them before we move on to indirect tax proposals. And then, of course, a conclusion, including a question and answer with all of you. Joining me today is my partner, Shefali Guradia from Bombay. She's a specialist on financial markets. And Rajiv Dimri, our leader for the indirect tax practice, based very much here with me in Delhi. So coming on to the macroeconomic indicators, which have been quite reassuring, uh, reassuring not only for all of us here in India, uh, but globally as India has, has emerged as the fastest growing large economy in the world. The good news is that our GDP growth rate, uh, which was estimated in 1415 to be at 7.2, uh, is expected to target 7.6% uh, this year. Uh, clearly an upward trend in growth. And of course, the economic survey talking about the fact that next year we could look at 7 .7 to 7.75% real GDP growth, which is quite significant. The potential, of course, as per the economic survey is that we could possibly be above 8%. Now, what's holding back India from reaching its potential? There are three basic assumptions that are, which are draining uh, or pulling down the estimation. One is the fact that there is a stronger correlation building up between the slowdown in the global economy, uh, where the correlation is expected that for every one percentage point dip in the global economy GDP, India gets impacted by 0.4. The second is, of course, the dependency on the oil price movement. India, during the course of this year, has been having an average buying at the rate of $45 to a barrel. Next year, it is expected to be assumed to be lower than this, and there's an assumption built around this. And finally, the good monsoons is what the government is hoping for as the El Nino effect changes over this year. So really three broad parameters which have an influence on the estimated growth rate for next year, which continues to be a robust 7 to 7.75%. The government, of course, has held on to the fiscal deficit target. It was estimated to be at 3.9% as per the FRBM this year, and the finance minister has said that he will stick to this. Importantly, he has said that while he's trying to balance growth with expenditure, he is trying to make sure that he sticks to the fiscal responsibility bill and holds the fiscal deficit to 3.5% in the coming year. He's also spoken about the fact that as far as the go-forward plan on fiscal responsibility is concerned, he'd like to revalidate some of the assumptions and some of the milestones and targets by setting up a new committee to look into the roadmap for fiscal deficit in the years to come. The revenue deficit similarly has moved down uh, as for the downward trend from 2.9 to 2.8 in 15-16. Inflation, which has been a bit of a bugbear for the Indian economy for the last decade or more, has shown a welcoming declining trend. When we look at the WPI, it is revised estimate of 14-15 was 2%. In 15-16, uh, it is we're going into negative of 2.8%. Really, it's been dragged down because of the commodity and oil price slippages. The consumer price index, on the other hand, in 16-17 is expected to be a reasonable 4.5%. So therefore, most of the macroeconomic indicators have been quite reassuring as we walk into the next year. During the course of the year, which has just gone by, the Finance Ministry, as well as the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, uh, did carry out several amendments to the foreign investment policy, uh, trying to liberalize more and allow foreign capital to come into defense, into insurance, and of course liberalize some of the rules around real estate and construction development activities. Continuing with that trend, the first real message that we're getting from the speech of the finance minister and his documents at his table in parliament is that the policymakers have become quite comfortable to allow foreign investment up to 49% in virtually all activities on an automatic approval basis. Symbolic of that is the fact that foreign investment in pension sector and insurance sectors, which have historically been sensitive sectors, are now going to be allowed 49% under the automatic route as long as there's Indian management and control. Similarly, the foreign portfolio investment in central PSUs, other than banks, which have been listed on the stock exchange, 
Uh, well, again, you have the ability to have foreign investment up to 49% from the existing 24. So really 49% has emerged as a minority shareholding up where the government is getting very comfortable with foreign investment. The other aspect is that they have opened up 100% foreign direct investment in asset reconstruction companies. And also in respect of NBFCs, historically, there were a limitation of 18 specified activities where foreign equity could come in under the automatic route. And there had been a clamor for years to come that as far as NBFCs are concerned, the government needs to revise the definition beyond the 18. Well, the announcement by the finance minister in the parliament is that they will do so. There was a lot of cheer uh, when the government finally made the announcement that 100% foreign equity will be allowed in the marketing of food products produced and manufactured in India under the approval route. What does this mean? This actually means that as far as government is concerned, it is going to allow retailing of food products which have been manufactured and processed in India. In some ways, this is a first step in relation to retail trading, something that this government has been reluctant upon. Finally, when we look at the type of instruments that can be issued under foreign investment laws, uh, well, the government had been very clear for years to come that they would look at equity or convertible instruments only. There was a lot of concern around investors who wanted to have call and put options in these instruments or how do you deal with partially convertible instruments. The announcement in the finance bill has been that hybrid instruments will be allowed as foreign equity subject to certain conditions. We need to sort of wait and watch and see what those conditions could be and whatever liberalization is being carried out. So I think the big message which is there is government is getting comfortable with foreign equity and is trying to slowly open up more and more foreign capital. The other aspect which is of importance is that over the last few years to get investor assurance, the government had been signing bilateral investment treaties with different countries. Now the government wants to carry forward that agenda through cooperative federalism with the state level and wants to also in, engage in a competition among the states for investor assurance, which effectively means the government is telling us that they want to get into center state investment agreements, which will be a back-to-back -to, -back to the BITs such that the investors not only have assurance from a federal government, but also from the state governments. This is a welcome move. One of the key aspects of the union budget, as we heard the talk of the finance minister, was an emphasis on the buildup of infrastructure. India needs nearly a trillion dollars of infrastructure play to be built up over the next five years. One of the aspects is the budgetary support and the budgetary allocation to roads, ports, and other forms of physical infrastructure to be built in India. The government is certainly committed to that, and a large share of the public spending is towards that. However, the government recognizes that that is not going to be adequate, and it needs to have private capital also playing in the build-up of infrastructure in this country, which effectively means the, the revival of the PPP, the public-private partnership uh, projects, to be taking off. Now, India had experimented with PPP. There have been a few success stories mainly the airports that we see in the major metros and certain other projects. However, when we look at a wider span, we have not seen PPPs being so widespread across the landscape of infrastructure. There was a move by the government under Dr. Kelka, who's a well-renowned economist, to try and relook at the working of the PPP in India. And he had chaired the committee, which had made certain significant recommendations. Carrying forward those recommendations into both legislative changes, the government has announced that they will be bringing in a public utility provision of disputes bill uh, to try and deal with the situation in making sure that the PPPs are able to resolve disputes. And also, there's a provision for how renegotiation of PPP concession agreements will take place. So some of the implementation action steps in relation to the PPP buildup of infrastructure is something that the government is committing upon. Moving on to the direct tax proposals, uh, the important changes that we are seeing is as follows. First is that insofar as individual taxation is concerned, the government has shown that it wants to maintain the tax base in India. And it does not therefore want to tamper anymore with uplifting the tax slabs. Uh, it wants to actually retain uh, most of the individuals within the tax base. And of course, it's providing for certain concessions for small taxpayers, taxpayers less than $10,000 in income to be given certain exemptions. 
The other aspect which is very, very clear is that he is trying to do a resource mobilization from the relatively well-off. And how is he trying to do that? I think three things that he's really putting out here. Firstly, he's increasing the surcharge on individuals to 15% for those having an income of more than 10 million rupees, which effectively means for them that the maximum rate for such individuals would be over 35.5%. So really, he's been inching forward the tax rates for the rich. Secondly, he's making dividend income for the rich uh, taxable at the rate of 10% when such a dividend income in the hands of the recipient exceeds 10 lakh rupees or million rupees. The third part is that insofar as employer contribution to Pro- Provident Fund is concerned, which is, a, which is the most widespread instrument for saving, he's saying any, uh, any of the contributions by the employer in excess of 1.5 lakh rupees will now be taxable as a perquisite. These are some of the measures that he thinks will help him bring some amount of emphasis on taxing the rich. He's also recognizing that he has to shift some of the saving instruments and get parity among the saving instruments, the foremost being the Provident Fund scheme in India in which millions of people invest. He's changing it to an exempt, exempt taxable regime, something that had been proposed also in the Direct Taxes Code in 2009. What is he proposing? He's proposing that all the provident fund withdrawals that take place in excess of 40% of the corpus attributed after the 1st of April 2016 uh, will be made taxable. The question, therefore, that comes to mind is that if you have a situation that somebody is making a contribution today, or when I say today, it's after the 1st of April 2016, and that is in excess of 1.5 lakh rupees, and if that is going to be a perquisite, then will there be a double taxation because at the time of withdrawal of the corpus? And the answer seems to be that possibly the government does not want a double taxation, and hence the withdrawal in excess of 40% is only in relation to people who are not excluded employees. And therefore, the definition of excluded employees, which is yet to be brought into the rule book, is something which is going to be critical to ensure we don't suffer a double taxation in this regime. Coming on to the corporate uh, tax side, on the corporate tax side, the finance minister has spoken about it in the last union budget, where he has set out a, the roadmap to bring down the corporate tax rate for domestic companies from 30% to 25% over a four-year period. Simplistically, most taxpayers expected that there would be a one percentage point rate cut that will happen in the corporate tax rates this year. Well, the finance minister has actually done something a little differently. What he has proposed is that he's brought in the futuristic 25% corporate tax rate into effect for the next year in respect of new manufacturing companies uh, that get established in India as long as these companies undertake not to take tax holidays, tax exemptions, and the like. So effectively, the 25% tax rate comes in for those companies uh, which forego the tax exemptions and are into manufacturing. The second thing that he has done is that insofar as domestic companies which have a turnover less than 50 million rupees, he has given them the 1% cut in the copper tax rate. But for all other large taxpayers, he has retained the tax structure as currently to make sure that he continues to have resource mobilization. So really, we have a matrix outcome in relation to the copper tax rates, given the fact that there are different thresholds of income and different thresholds of turnover uh, on the basis of which the rates are determined. The other aspect which the finance minister dealt with was the tax holiday for startups. This has been announced already by the finance minister and the prime minister when they rolled the policy on startups. India wants to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship and therefore had provided for a 100% deduction for profits of startups that get established for the next three years. And then, of course, the deduction applies for any of the three or the five initial years. Matt, of course, uh, will continue to apply to such income. He's also tried to help resource mobilization by entrepreneurs who may have a disposal of a residential property if they proceed to invest this va- the value of the capital gain into shares of eligible startups and such startups then buy eligible assets. So really, in some ways, convert uh, certain immovable assets into entrepreneurship assets. He's also looked at some of the key asset issues which are facing select sectors, power, telecom, and infrastructure. And he's dealt with issues which could potentially be litigated in these sectors. Firstly, he's 
put forward a proposition that while generation and distribution had uh, additional depreciation, he extended that to even power transmission, which is, of course, lying in the middle of the supply chain between generation and distribution. On the spectrum payments by telecom companies, he has aligned the deductibility of the spectrum payments to that for the licenses that are which are uh, which have been a lot allocated, which has been on the basis that these will not be intangible assets depreciable at the rate of 25%, but will be amortized over the life of the spectrum that has been allocated. So really, it's defined the rules out there. Insofar as the infrastructure sector is concerned, uh, the finance minister's roadmap was to take away the tax holidays from those facilities which do not set up uh, and don't go into activity by the 1st of April 2017. For these infrastructure facilities, which is roads, ports, power, uh, roads, ports, airports, and the like, uh, he has actually put a transition provision enabling them to move away from uh, the tax holiday from the 1st of April 2017 to actually having a capital deduction uh, of 100% in relation to their operations. So really, he's moved them from a profit-linked to investment-linked uh, tax break. There's also some other exemptions for foreign companies. Uh, you know, India wants to take advantage of the low crude oil uh, prices to create storage capacities in India and encourage investors to actually hold inventories of crude in India. Uh, and he has provided for a tax exemption in relation to the activity of storage and sale that takes place from such facilities in India. It is hoped that this facility will get extended over a period of time to not just crude, but also to other petroleum products and LNG. There's also been uh, some amount of changes which have taken place in relation to uh, the uncut and assorted diamond activity of uh, display by foreign diamond mining companies in notified zones. So these are some of the changes which are there. But more important changes really sit around the, how the funds, including the REITs and INVITs, and certain other sectors will be taxed. Moving to that, I will request my partner, Shifali Goradia, to take up those changes. Thank you, Gokul. Uh, moving on to the reforms in the financial service sector, uh, there was clearly a lot of focus from the finance minister on bringing in some key reforms that have been long pending to revive some of the uh, ailing players in the financial services sector. Uh, there was an announcement uh, to introduce a comprehensive code on resolution of financial firms uh, to tackle the systemic vacuum with regard to bankruptcy situations in financial firms. There is already a bill on insolvency and bankruptcy which is uh, tabled before the parliament. And once this code is legislated along with this bill, uh, it will provide specific resolution mechanisms to deal with the bankruptcy of banks, insurance companies, and certain other financial sector companies. Uh, there is also a proposal to amend the securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of Security Interest Act, the SARFACI Act, to enable the sponsors of these asset reconstruction companies to hold up to 100% stake in the ARCs. The investment ceiling which currently existed, uh, it was a huge bottleneck and could not channelize the much-needed capital into these asset reconstruction companies. But with this liberalization, it will help to tackle the problem of stressed assets in the banking sectors. There is also the proposal to allow the non-institutional investors to invest in the securitized receipts. There is also another proposal to strengthen the debt recovery tribunals by increasing their bench strength and uh, electro, uh, to, to introduce certain electronic processes for faster uh, processing of claims. There is a proposal to revamp the public sector uh, undertaking banks, uh, which would address the structural issues in sectors such as power, coal, highways, etc., in which the public sector banks have significant credit exposure. Uh, there is also an allocation of uh, about $3.67 billion towards the recapitalization of the PSU banks to facilitate credit growth of these PSU banks. Uh, the other sectoral reforms in the financial sector are uh, in relation to the deepening of the Indian corporate bond market. 
I think this is the third consecutive budget where the finance minister has again laid stress that there is a need to further strengthen the corporate bond market. And towards that, several steps have been announced, uh, which we will see uh, implemented in the course of the forthcoming financial year. Uh, there is a proposal that the Life Insurance Corporation will set up a dedicated fund for credit enhancement of the infrastructure projects. This will in turn improve the credit rating of the infrastructure projects, which will allow them uh, to access uh, uh, more qualitative uh, uh, capital. Uh, there will be a bank board bureau, which will be operationalized. This bureau was already introduced uh, in the last budget, uh, focused on improving the governance of the public sector banks. Uh, this will chart out a roadmap for consolidation of the PSU banks. There have been several other uh, announcements in relation to the amendment of the SEBI Act to provide for more members and to increase the benches for the Securities Appellate Tribunal. Uh, a financial data management sector center will be established to facilitate the integrated data aggregation and analysis in the financial services sector. Uh, in order to uh, uh, vitalize the commodity derivatives market, uh, SEBI is likely to come out with new derivative products uh, and hopefully this will bring in some new vigor in the commodities derivatives market, which has been ailing for some time due to certain transaction taxes. Moving on to the taxation of funds, uh, on an overall basis, I think most pooling vehicles have got some benefit from this budget proposals. The securitization trusts uh, have now been given a complete pass-through, and the tax that has been deducted at source uh, on income distribution, on that there has been a proposal to rationalize where any distribution made by the Securitization Trust to the Indian resident individuals will continue to suffer a 25% withholding tax. Uh, for the other investors, it will be a 30% tax. But if there are foreign investors who are entitled to reduced rate under their respective tax treaties, then those reduced rate benefits will be available at the withholding stage. In relation to the alternative investment funds, uh, there was a demand of extending the pass-through to the other category of AIFs, the third uh, category of AIFs, which is largely hedge funds in nature, but that has not been acceded to. Uh, what has been done, though, is the distribution by the AIF to the non-residents will again now be subject to the reduced rate available under the applicable tax treaties. So therefore, the mandatory 10% withholding rate on all distributions made by the AIFs will now not suffer a tax, where the distributions are being made, for example, to a Mauritius company, which enjoys uh, no withholding tax or a reduced withholding rate under the tax treaty. Uh, there was also another proposal to uh, exempt the distributions made out of the exempt income, such as dividends, received by the AIS, but that uh, does not find place in the uh, finance bill as yet. Moving on to the REITs and the INWITs. These are the real estate investment trusts and the infrastructure trusts, where uh, the investors' monies are pooled to channelize into the downline special purpose vehicles holding the respective assets. The dividends distributed by a special purpose vehicle to a business trust which is organized as a REIT or an INVIT will now not be subject to the dividend distribution tax. Uh, the condition remains that these SPVs must be wholly owned by the REITs or INVITs. The exemption is available only on profits generated post the transfer of the SPV under the REIT or an INVIT. So the past profits will not benefit from this exemption uh, uh, from the DDT. And the investors in these INVITs and REITs will also not be subject to tax on such dividends. So there is a complete pass through as far as the dividends are concerned, where the SPVs down below pass on the dividends to the trust and then trust passes on that income all the way up to the investors. This is a very positive move, and it will uh, strengthen the case uh, for the REITs and INVITs 
uh, in the coming year. On the safe harbor for the funds managed from India, uh, there were uh, many representations made over the last year to relax the conditions. Uh, India uh, is uh, launching on the Make in India movement, and there was an equivalent proposal to uh, manage the funds from India, to make India an attractive jurisdiction for the fund managers to be located in India. Uh, normally, location of fund managers in India uh, could uh, prejudice the tax exemptions that the foreign funds are entitled to under their respective tax treaties. The safe harbor which is currently provided is not enough to cover all situations of foreign funds and in fact it does not cover most foreign funds that are currently investing in India. The criteria on two counts has been relaxed in this budget proposals where even if the funds are not tax residents of foreign countries, but so long as they are set up in a foreign country, which is a, 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 a notified territory, that is sufficient for uh, being eligible for the safe harbor provisions. Likewise, uh, these provisions will only uh, uh, apply in relation to the funds activities in India. So if an Indian fund manager is managing a foreign fund, which is investing in non-Indian jurisdictions, then uh, it does not need to satisfy these eligible condi eligibility conditions. So these are two positive movements, but again, a lot more needs to be done before the funds can really take any meaningful benefit of these safe harbor provisions. Moving on to the patent box regime, uh, this is a, a very positive move uh, from the Indian government where while most other countries are marginalizing their uh, tax incentive regimes, uh, India has introduced this new patent box regime, which offers an incentivized rate of 10% on all royalties earned by uh, persons who have developed and registered patents in India. So the royalty income, which will be then eligible for this beneficial rate of 10%, uh, will also not suffer from any minimum alternate tax. But these benefits are available only to the true and the first owner who registers the patents in India. This is a move to uh, encourage innovation in India and for persons to register their patents in India rather than uh, migrating the IP from India to other offshore locations. Interestingly, uh, in response to the BEPS, a movement where OECD along with G20 have been uh, putting out various action plans to address different situations which lead to the base erosion in the source countries. Uh, there is a proposal uh, to levy an equalization levy on online advertisements. This was one of the proposals considered in the action plan one on digital economy but it was uh, uh, shelved and not really adopted by the task force because this was viewed as an alternative way to address a broader DT challenge, but it had its own challenges in relation to synchronizing with the existing bilateral treaties. India has uh, uh, jumped the gun on this and introduced in the domestic law. This is not a part of the Income Tax Act, though administratively the collection mechanism is all to be governed under the income tax law, uh, this levy will be collected and paid by the Indian residents making, pay, making payments for online advertisements to non-residents do not having a permanent establishment in India. It's a 6% withholding levy on the gross amount of consideration and currently there is only one category of income which is covered which is the online advertisement services. Uh, the government has left the window open to include additional services in future, uh, all in relation to the digital space. So uh, this may be an indication of how India might go in future. Uh, there will be challenges around whether this tax is an income tax or not, whether can this be viewed as a tax covered under a double tax avoidance agreement. Um, is there sufficient territorial nexus for India to collect the tax where the services are rendered from outside India 
and the indian customers are merely paying for availing of this service uh, but uh, uh, we will have to wait to see how uh, india really applies this in the context of countries where it has a double tax avoidance agreement where it is obliged under the vienna convention to implement and apply the double tax avoidance agreement in good faith uh, if the indian residents do not withhold the tax there are disallowances on account of non compliance India has also introduced the country by country reporting requirements under the transfer pricing regulations with effect from April 1 2016 uh the limit for the consolidated revenues of group uh, is prescribed at uh, equi- indian equivalent of a uh, euro 750 million which is the current international consensus so here india has uh, been in sync and aligned itself to the positions taken by other countries in relation to the cbcr reporting the documentation requirements are also based on the template provided in the oecd beps action plan 13 the cbcr uh, reporting is to be filed by a parent or an alternate entity or in certain cases by the constituent entity which are resident in india so constituent entity uh, and alternate entity are also defined in the finance bill and the constituent entity includes an indian permanent establishment of the foreign company the detailed rules in this respect are, are likely to follow uh, but this is the change that we were expecting uh, to see and it will come into effect starting from the financial year beginning with april 1 2016 uh, other provisions in relation to uh, the assessment uh, time limit available to the transfer pricing officer uh, have also been extended so there will now the transfer pricing officer has a minimum period of 60 days uh, to complete his assessment before uh, the assessing officer the tax officer has to complete his tax audit uh, this limit is extended beyond 60 days where the court has stayed the assessment or where there is a reference made to the competent authority for exchange of information the completion of assessment period has also been now reduced from a period of 24 months to 21 months where there is no transfer pricing reference made or cases where a transfer pricing reference has been made the time period has been reduced from 36 months to 33 months other than that we have not seen too many changes in the transfer pricing regime in this budget uh, the finance minister reemphasized that the guard is on schedule it is expected to be implemented with effect from april 1 2017 so now we have one more year in which the government should be putting out more guidance and clarifications in on situations where guard will be applied the buyback distribution tax has seen some change where now it covers all forms of distribution including the capital reduction with effect from june 1 2016 uh there were earlier it covered only certain buybacks which were conducted under section 77a of the companies act the s5 companies act but now it has been uh, broadened to cover even the court schemes uh, which entail capital reduction there is there are also rules to be notified to determine the amount received by the company for issue of shares uh in a in a case of merger or a demerger this will see some impact on the effective cash repatriation strategies that the indian companies have been uh, adopting the place of effective management rules which were introduced uh, in the last budget and were already effective from 1st of april 2015 have now been deferred by one more year to 1st of april 2016 this is again in line uh, of the expectations because there was no uh, surrounding rules in terms of the uh, cases where such poem might be implicated or how the expense deduction for the foreign companies having poem in india will be calculated there is still no, not enough clarity on this because all we have as of now is a draft circular uh, and the guidelines have not yet been finalized but we would uh, uh we would look out for the the revised set of guidelines which will take into account all the representations that have been made and hopefully we will have a clear understanding of the regime uh before this uh, rules are applied for the financial year 16 17 
there is still uh, uh, the foreign tax credit mechanism, etc., is not yet provided for. Maybe before the finance bill uh, is passed, uh, we will see some more amendments uh, in this regard. Interestingly, this is the first year where we've seen some uh, landmark proposals in relation to government's effort to reduce the dispute resolutions. Uh, there has been a proposal uh, for any tax arrear which is in a case pending before the commissioner appeals uh, that can now be taken into an alternative dispute resolution mechanism where uh, if the taxpayer agrees to settle by payment of tax and interest all the way up to the assessment date and agrees to pay a 25% penal, penalty, uh, in such a case, the case will be then treated as withdrawn and there will be no further litigation on the cases pending before the Commissioner appeals. Likewise, even for the specified tax, which is the disputes arising in cases where the retrospective tax on indirect transport or some other provisions which, ever, which were amended retroactively uh, has been invoked, in such cases as well, the taxpayers have been offered a proposal to opt for a payment of tax arrear, and then they will be given immunity from payment of any interest or penalty. This will be applicable to cases such as Vodafone and Cane, which are pending before international arbitration, and uh, it remains to be seen whether these foreign companies will see any incentive in taking the offer of the government because what they are disputing basically is the levy of tax itself. And uh, since the interest and penalty cost is also substantially high, uh, offer of the government to settle only by collecting tax may have merit, uh, but uh, it will depend on how their arbitration proceedings uh, proce uh, proceed outside India. There is overall also the intent to minimize the litigation, and therefore the government has moved back on its proposal to allow the tax officers to challenge the dispute resolution panel directions in an appeal before the tribunal. This probably will lead to a stringent action by the dispute resolution panels, and they would again be reluctant to give relief where we had seen some uh, uh, positive action in the last year once the appeal mechanism was provided. Uh, there were other key clarifications that were introduced, uh, and uh, the significant one being that the private company shares, the unlisted shares, uh, there was uh, uh, some doubt or uh, ambiguity around the rate of tax applicable to the sale of shares, whether it should be 10% or 20%. And uh, it has now been clarified that the 10% rate will apply uh, also to all private companies uh, in which public uh, are not substantially interested. Uh, there is still some ambiguity left around what happens to the companies which could be subsidiaries of listed companies, but hopefully this will get addressed by the time the finance bill is enacted. Uh, the MAC provisions uh, which were applicable uh, to foreign companies have also now been brought into law uh, and announced that these MAC provisions will not apply uh, to the FIIs or other foreign companies coming from treaty countries provided that they do not have a permanent establishment in India, and that these foreign companies uh, do not need to register under uh, the Companies Act in India. The other incentives that have been given are in relation to the, uh, the fiscal framework for the International Financial Services Center, where currently there is a gift city uh, in Ahmedabad, where there is an exemption provided under Section 1038 for the long-term capital gains. Uh, there is also a reduced rate of MAD, the minimum alternate tax of 9%, which would apply to these companies or units set up in the International Financial Service Center. They've been given exemption from DDT, and that no securities transaction tax or a commodities transaction tax may also be uh, applicable to these units. These are significant incentives and hopefully this will uh, augur further investments into this International Financial Service Center. There has been some further rationalization of the withholding taxes applicable uh, on, at the domestic company level. Uh, the thresholds have been increased. At the same time, some of the rates have also been reduced. There is a proposal uh, to allow the non-banking and financial companies 
to make a provision for up to 5% of their gross income uh, for the bad and doubtful debts. The penalties for underreporting of income have now been pegged at a level of 50% of the tax payable, whereas in the case of misreporting of income, there will be a 200% uh, of the tax recovered as penalty. So this proposal take away the discretion given to the assessing officers to impose penalty between 100% to 200%. Uh, there has also been further rationalization in terms of the preliminary assessments that can be made where uh, the assessing officer will now have the power uh, to make some upward adjustments provided he gives the opportunity of being heard to the taxpayers. And lastly, uh, the government has also announced the scheme for disclosure of income uh, for persons who have not disclosed certain income in past, where they, could, they can pay an effective tax rate of 45%, 45 which includes uh, both the, the basic tax plus interest, plus penalty, and by paying this 45% tax, they can have immunity from both uh, income tax as well as wealth tax act. Interestingly, they have an immunity from prosecution under the income and wealth tax act, but the immunity under other provisions of law or the regulations has not been offered. So overall, uh, a positive budget, uh, lots of changes, uh, good movements towards simplification and rationalization, uh, I will now hand over to Rajiv Dimri to take over on the indirect tax proposals. Uh, thank you, Shifali. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will uh, quickly cover uh, some of the key indirect tax changes. Uh, just as Shifali mentioned, there are lots and lots of changes in the direct tax. Similarly, there are some uh, very interesting and far-reaching changes that have been proposed or affected in the indirect taxes. Let me start with uh, service tax uh, key amendments. Uh, one of the first item is uh, where uh, assignment of rights to use radio frequency is granted by the government or if there is any subsequent transfer of that right from one uh, entity to another, that has now been declared to be uh, a service and liable for service tax. Uh, and this, of course, uh, you know, involves large amount of uh, license fee that telecom and other similar players would be paying. And this becoming liable to tax is a material uh, development, uh, not just from a quantum perspective, but now service tax is getting into areas which were earlier considered to be sovereign rights uh, and therefore were meant to be not liable for service tax. So it's a material uh, change in the thought process. Uh, and perhaps in future, similar other services uh, or activities might be liable to service tax. Uh, the other aspect uh, that they have introduced uh, within this um, taxability is that the credit eligibility, so the company will pay on a reverse charge basis. Of course, that amount would be eligible for credit, but the credit eligibility is to be spread over the period for which the right is granted, which effectively means that the company may end up paying taxes today on a lump sum basis, but utilize the credit over a period of time. This uh, will help the government in terms of cash flow where the money gets collected today and the credit is given out over a period of time. Uh, Gokul was talking about a similar uh, provision from a corporate tax perspective where the deductibility of these license fee may be spread over the life of the, the you know, entitlement rather than in any other mechanism. So both these provisions will allow government some cash flow advantage in terms of taxes. Uh, continuing with the uh, overall thought process of trimming down exemptions, um, certain exemptions uh, have been withdrawn, which includes construction of uh, monorail and metros. Uh, the exemption on inbound cargo or ocean freight uh, has been now uh, been affected, and therefore freight paid for bringing goods into India will now be liable for service tax. This again is a material development in the thought process. Today it has only been introduced for inbound ocean freight, but there are other modes of transport, and one needs to see whether in future uh, even those will become liable to tax. Uh, the final bastion of uh, services uh, or service providers, which includes senior advocates, have now been covered. So while it is not a material change in terms of core taxability, these amounts were liable on a reverse charge basis but now senior advocates have been made liable to pay tax uh, by themselves. 
the you know in in the past years the finance minister had announced that uh, cesses and surcharges are not compatible with gst and therefore there was an effort to rationalize and reduce uh, these uh, cesses and surcharges uh, similarly in this year alone uh, there are 13 odd uh, different cesses that have been uh, revoked however a new uh, cess uh, which is called the uh, krishi kalyan cess or farmer welfare cess at half percent has been made applicable so along with swachh bharat cess uh, effectively now there is a 1% uh, cess that will apply on all taxable services Uh, the exemption has now been granted for low income uh, housing and this uh, is meant to be uh, a benefit to you know provide quality housing to a large number of, of people across the length and breadth of the country so it's one of the sort of pet project of the new administration and enabling exemptions have been granted for that some uh, significant changes have been made in the sendred credit rules uh, some of these changes have been uh, under you know sort of demand by the industry for a very long time uh, so series of changes have been made and to my mind many of those changes uh, reflect a, a a new thought process where some really far reaching benefits have been provided to the tax paying <clears throat> community uh, some of the key ones are where uh, if centralized credits are taken and, and if they need to be distributed across multiple units the existing scheme required them to spread it over all units uh, whether they were exempt uh, activities or otherwise and that resulted in under utilization of credits by the taxpayer and there was a loss of credits uh, those provisions have been uh, streamlined to require spreading of credits only to the relevant units and hopefully this will allow uh, companies with multiple units to have better utilization of sendred credit uh, in a material change and somewhat surprising pleasantly surprising change is where an input service distributor can now be distributed to outsource manufacturing units which means legal entity a can now distribute credits to another legal entity so long as there is a job working relationship uh, this would certainly go uh, a long way in optimizing credits for large number of companies that use third party job workers uh, for manufacturing part of the business uh, activities so it's a material change in not just the impact but also the thought process of giving uh, benefits for eligible input credit uh, similarly there are you know several rationalization measures have been announced or uh, for companies that have a mixed profile of taxable and non taxable activities uh, some of the allocation rules have been simplified and perhaps this will dis uh, resolve disputes or minimize disputes that often arises in these distribution uh, mechanisms coming to central excise uh, the key amendments are where which is largely in line with trying to make uh, you know uh, manufacturing in india more attractive so duties have been rationalized along a range of uh, it uh, equipment whether these are routers modems uh, etc where manufacturing in india will give an advantage as opposed to simply import and sale into india uh, the two taxes have been reintroduced for branded garments as well as for jewelry india has tried these experiments in the past for some reason they were not successful and they were withdrawn uh, i hope this time the measures uh, will be more thought through uh, and therefore these should become uh, you know a, a successful um, examples of bringing entire business activity into the tax net and removing exemptions uh, smart watches and accessories of motor vehicles have now been covered under the retail sale price mechanism uh, and again is uh, along the lines of all packaged products must have a consistent um, mechanism for taxing so these are more rationalization measures uh, mro in this budget across central excise and customs have been uh, attempted to be revived uh, it was an activity couple of years ago which was uh, taking shape in india but for tax inefficiencies this activity could not uh, be flourish in india i think this time around they tried to address many of the issues for the mro activity and hopefully the mro activity will uh, take uh, you know shape uh, one more time on 
locomotives uh, as part of the Make in India program, uh, certain inverted duty structures have been rationalized, and hopefully the unlocked, they, it will unlock the credit chain in manufacture of locomotives. Uh, one of the, another example of uh, new CES is the infrastructure CES, which has currently been applied on motor vehicles at varying rates from 1% to 4%. Uh, today it's only on, on motor vehicles, but it's likely that in future this may be expanded to similar other items. Uh, and there is also an option uh, provided to file revised returns under self excise along the lines of a service tax, so this is more a rationalization measure. Coming to customs, as I mentioned, uh, as part of the Make in India program for excise uh, and for customs, across range of IT and telecommunication uh, products, uh, duties have been restructured, principally designed to make manufacturing in India more attractive than what it is currently. Uh, arbitrage of anywhere between 4 to 9 percent is now available across a range of products, um, and I guess over a period of time, uh, these duties may be further tweaked to make the advantage of make, making in India a lot more sharper. In a material development on custom uh, duties, uh, the exemptions that existed for defense procurement uh, have now been withdrawn. Now, these exemptions have existed for decades, uh, but in, in the last couple of years, all exemptions, including exemptions on defense procurement, whether these are of excise duty and or, or in the customs duties, have now been withdrawn, which effectively means there would be no arbitrage for a foreign supplier versus an Indian supplier. And I think these are level playing field being created for domestic manufacture of defense products. So it's a material change uh, and certainly will uh, go a long way in getting started the defense production in India. In a series of rationalization measures, the whole scheme related to bonded warehouses have been uh, rationalized, uh, effectively allowing legislative framework to make sure a bonded warehouse can be operated anywhere in the country. This will also become a backbone for a plan that the government has announced of creating a duty deferral program so while this is not going to reduce the duties, but if shifts the time of payment of duty, I'm sure it will create a huge cash flow advantage for a large number of importers. Uh, rather than having to pay duty at the point of import, they may be able to defer the duty to the point of actual consumption, giving them a cash flow advantage. In other key developments, uh, there are rationalization across uh, central excise, custom duty, and service tax on interest. In the last two, three years, the interest rates on delayed payment or any demand were rising up to 30%, and it was effectively becoming a mandatory penalty rather than a compensatory uh, cost of interest. And across central excise, customs, and service tax, the rates have been rationalized at 15% largely, except in cases where the duties have been collected and not deposited where the amounts are higher. Uh, on the other hand, the normal period of limitation, which usually was 1% or one year across uh, custom excise, service tax, and, and, uh, excise and customs, have now been increased to two or two and a half years. So government will get more time uh, to look back under normal circumstances, uh, and that perhaps is because there are more self-assessment procedures in place now. Uh, just as we saw across direct tax that there's a serious effort to have dispute resolution schemes to lighten up the litigation environment, uh, just as we saw in corporate tax that there's a scheme now for voluntary dispute settlement, uh, similarly across customs, excise, and service tax, a scheme has been announced that any time between June and December, one could apply for settlement of uh, you know, cases pending at commissioner appeal by paying the duty and interest, and penalties will be foregone. Uh, in a, another development under CST, one of the big dispute across the country was the, on the nature of sale. If the sale is of uh, you know, LNG and other gas through a pipeline, there was often a debate between the CST law and the state law as to which is the appropriate, tax, appropriate law for taxing it has now been clarified in the CST law 
that those type of transactions will be liable for TST rather than state VAT. So on a go-forward basis, this will resolve a huge amount of disputes, uh, but for the past, I guess the courts will have to decide that. Uh, a notable omission was that there was no specific announcement on GST, uh, but the budget session is still on, and hopefully some developments will happen in the next uh, couple of months. So with that, where do we see the overall slant of the budget? Uh, we think it's pragmatic and well-defined. Serious attempt has been made at multiple levels, whether that is reviving rural economy, whether that is rationalizing taxes across, whether that is rationalizing and giving uh, an option for dispute settlement. Uh, in another uh, you know, announcement, a large number of additional SISTAT benches have been provided, which certainly will help in expediting uh, the dis settlement of disputes. Uh, at least at a macro level, the government's goal seems very clear and consistent. Uh, there is a clear impetus to government's flagship program, whether that is Make in India or Digital India or Startup India. If we look at both customs and uh, corporate tax changes, the flagship programs have received some attention uh, through various uh, tax incentives. We see convergence with BEPS action plan on cards. Some action has already taken place, and we hope that the tax litigation environment will, over a period of time, calm down where the government is showing actual uh, offer of settlement, which has never been tried in the past uh, in India. Hopefully, this is a new beginning to make sure that the tax litigation environment will see uh, a downward trend. With that, I think we'll take some questions. Okay, as we are, uh, thank you Rajiv, uh, we have a few questions which have come in and actually we have time only for a few questions. Um, the first sort of question which is uh, coming in, uh, and I would request Shefali to respond to this, whether benefits of the tax treaties would be available in relation to the equalization levy uh, that has been proposed in the finance bill. So over to Shefali. So the, uh, it will, it will uh, you know, remain to be seen as to how uh, things really pan out. But uh, based on whatever we are seeing in the BEPS proposals, equalization levy is just an alternate uh, form of a direct tax. And uh, if it is substantially similar to an income tax, then it should be covered under the tax treaties. However, uh, OECD itself has recognized that such a form of equalization levy could result into double taxation, and therefore they had proposed two alternatives to the countries. First, uh, uh, this tax could possibly be levied by the source countries only where the foreign company is not subject to a corporate tax in its home jurisdiction, or if it is subject to a very low rate of tax. In such a case, uh, it could be okay for the companies to suffer this additional equalization levy in the source countries. However, if the foreign companies are subject to a minimum corporate tax rate in their home jurisdictions, in such a case, there will have to be a mechanism which allows them to take the credit for this equalization levy. But since this was just a proposal before the OECD, Ultimately, it has been left to the countries to calibrate their own domestic law provisions to make sure that this kind of a levy does not result into double taxation. Thank you, Shafali. There's one other question uh, which is there. Um, with a 10% tax on dividends for individual, is there a double taxation? And, of course, then it goes forward to ask the question whether the tax levied is in excess of 10 lakhs or on the whole amount. I think in the interest uh, of um, a quick response, all I'll say is that, uh, well, a lot of people have always claimed that there was a double taxation of, uh, of corporate income by being taxed one at the hands of the company and then later when the company pays the dividends. Now we're probably seeing a tripling of that with the tax being paid on dividends both at the hands of the company to the extent of 20% nearly, and then of course 10% incrementally in re respect to certain taxpayers who are in excess of dividend income of 10 lakhs. So yes, there is a 
uh, additional layer of taxation which is happening. Uh, I think the framework of the tax law enables that to happen because we are talking about two sets of taxpayers who are really getting impacted here rather than the same person being taxed twice. I think the other aspect which is there is the memorandum is relatively clear while the bill is not so. Uh, where it actually talks about the income by way of dividends in excess of 10 lakhs shall be chargeable to tax in the hands of the individual. And it sort of goes forward to say the taxation of dividend income in excess of rupees 10 lakhs shall be on a gross basis. So I think the threshold of 10 lakhs and amounts less than 10 lakhs in the hands of the shareholder continue to have the status of exempt income. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll sort of just uh, request Rajiv to take uh, one or at maximum two questions on indirect taxes before we bring this webinar to a close. Uh, thank you, Gokul. Uh, there are several questions, but uh, in the interest of time, let me take the ones that I think might be of larger interest uh, to people. Uh, one of the questions is, what is the scope of outsourced manufacturing units in the definition of ISD? Um, very quickly, uh, it requires the relationship to be that of a job worker and in a manner where the job worker is paying excise duty at the full selling price of the product. So whether they are under 4A or, or Rule 10A, uh, which effectively means if the excise duty is being paid on the full selling price of the goods, there is no reason why credits associated with those goods ought not to get credit, uh, and therefore that's the definition that relationship need to be that of a job worker, and the selling price should be the full price, and there are two mechanisms that allow that, uh, Section 4A or Rule uh, 10A. Uh, so I do think that uh, this is something that's going to benefit a large number of taxpayers who do use third-party manufacturers uh, for uh, final product. Uh, the, another question is, what is the scope of applicability of infrastructure sets? Uh, currently, it is only applicable on automobiles, uh, passenger cars, at different rates, uh, depending on what is the size or the engine capacity of the car. Uh, there are some exemptions on you know, uh, energy-efficient cars. Uh, but what I do see it is that in coming years, uh, this could be expanded to other products. And therefore, while it, a beginning has been made only in relation to motor vehicles, uh, surely this will grow in times to come. I think with that, we have completely run out of time. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us your time. Um, if you have any more questions, you could write to us, and we'll try and get back to you. Thank you so much.